Okay, so here we are after a year of doing episodes for this podcast. We're on the final one, the final, final one, the final add-on, as you might say. I've done four of these add-on episodes and, um, and here we are. So it's quite tempting, I suppose, to... At the, at the final episode to go, well, here's my arguments, I'm right, you know, all this sort of thing. Um, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is arguably do the opposite, which is to say to you all, well, to be perfectly honest, this could all be bollocks. <laughs> and we may need to start all over again because we've got something fundamentally wrong. And... And this reflects a uh, tension, doesn't it, that's in this notion of revolution. Because everyone has two ideas about revolution, or at least our culture gives us these two stories. One story is, it's a revolution, everything's going to change, everything's going to be perfect, you know, everything's going to get totally better, all this sort of stuff. And then or the other extremes, this other story, which is a revolution is like a revolution, i.e., you go round and start where you were. And there's lots of stories about this and in history, of course. If you have the revolution, you've got all these great ideas and then it all turns to shit and you, you end up with a new dictatorship and therefore revolutions are hopeless, all that sort of thing. All right, so... So one of the main criticisms, I suspect, of all the work we've done together, assuming you've watched all the episodes or some of them is yeah it's all very well it's all very well but people are just fundamentally unevolved bad they haven't transformed themselves they're people are shit and they just create shit all this sort of sort of argument and I remember there was a guy at the beginning of Extinction Rebellion and he was in some pop group or something and he came to a meeting and he was going there's no point, there's no point doing Extension Rebellion, there's no point doing all this outward activism unless people have personally transformed themselves. There's no point doing anything. We need to focus on ourselves first and then once, once we've transformed ourselves, then maybe we can enter into the public realm. So as you can imagine, um, I found that a little bit annoying. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, quite annoying actually. Uh, not least, of course, because, okay, so, you know, you transform yourself and what's the pathway to action? What happens next? It's not really that well worked out. But what I want to do is is to take this criticism seriously in so much as there's something real there, right? And um, we've looked at this a little bit in the episodes, but I want to look at it more explicitly. Um because there's no question that there's people that are really tricky out there and I'm not necessarily passing any judgment on them. I'm just saying it's just an empirical reality that if you're working in a group where people are aggressive, you know, they take up lots of emotional space, they're guilt trippy, you know, they've got lack of self-reflexivity or whatever, it's a real problem and it does destroy groups on a regular basis. And we talked about, you know, how we can design things so that becomes less of a problem. Um, but there's something deeper going on and maybe I can give you an example here. So when I was in my 20s, I spent a lot of time studying um, and visiting communes, alternative communities, intentional communities, you know, there's various names for them. And... To simplify somewhat, there was quite a, a big difference between the secular ones and the religious ones. So at the secular ones, there was this tendency for people to join them and to be going, I want to join a community because I want the benefits of community. I want people to listen to me. I want people to care for me. I want to become more whole. I need help to do that. And as you can imagine... It was just a matter of time before people got bitter and twisted and went, you know, you've got to have a six hour meeting to hear why I'm not being listened to. I'm not being cared for. And it all ends in, you know, tears. And then 
you can juxtapose that to these religious or at least spiritual s communities where people are going i'm entering this community be in community and i define being in community as me giving of myself me being in service of me transcending myself into into um a place of giving as you might say and there's variations on the theme but the fact of the matter is sociologically speaking there's a big difference in the outcome and there's strong arguments to say that this is a, a major determining factor on the sustainability of the of these communities and um and that translates into this idea we've been talking about quite a lot which is okay the rule of thumb is is people that join you know the revolutionary project they need to be into teamwork uh, and they need to have this ethos of service trust and and respect because this oils the wheels as you might say of of the structure structures and the functional hierarchy and all the rest of it um but i want to look at this in a more deeper way you know we this is the last add-on episode and the whole idea of these add-ons is to say to you all, look, you know, in case you're still under the illusion, a, a revolution by definition cannot be utopian because it exists in time and space, in, it exists in society. Utopia is an abstraction. In other words, it's always, there's always going to be shit going on. And there's some really big problems, you know, there's the big problem of inequality, capitalism, there's the big problem of power, there's the big problem of alienation. We're not going to get rid of these things. And there's the big problem that people can and are bad people, right? So it's, this is a hard problem because it's very difficult to define what a good person is and, and to get a good person to be good. So, for instance, there's this research that Tim Schneider did uh, on World War II, which I may have mentioned, where he was looking at, you know, why did people take in the Jews? Why were people courageous? Why were they super decent, heroic types? You know, what was the determining factor on this? And was it because they lived in the country or, you know, the city? Or were they Catholics or Protestants? Were they communists or were they conservatives? Anyway, he said there was basically no determining factor other than this vague idea of of self-knowledge. In other words, for me, I think that's like a, a, an aspect of personality. But the problem with the concept of personality is it's very vague. I mean, you know, how, how do you get a grip on that one? So this is a big, it's a hard problem, right? No one's really worked out how you're going to get all these people to be great. And then the other thing is, OK, so you create a good person, you work out a pathway to create good people. And then it's like, what exactly is a good person? You know, sometimes people are good in one context that, you know, in their personal lives, they're really shit or maybe they're good and then they go bad. <laughs> you know, you get too much power or, or something or what makes them good is what makes them bad, which is even more complicated, right? So, for instance, you know, I've got a soft spot for Larry Kramer, you know, one of the big guys in ACT UP. And he was amazing. He was really emotional. He was out there. He was an extrovert, you know, he was New York queen, to lump bum bum And then, um, but he's really difficult to work with. And I think they actually chucked him out eventually because, you know, they were trying to get on with the job. You know, there's all the backroom stuff, right? It's not all Larry Kramer making big speeches. And then... You know, there's Schindler, I've forgotten his first name, but the guy in Schindler's List, which is a classic example, a really good guy who was a little bit of a bad guy, right? You know, he's amazing, saved all these Jews. But, you know, to be blunt, he was a criminal before the war. And I think, I've got my facts right, he went back to being a criminal, at least a, a tricky character uh, from various points of view after, all, after the war. So how do you work that one out? So it's complicated business. But I'm not, you know, I'm making that point... Um, Yes, there's an irreducible hard problem here. And at the same time, like with the other themes in these add-ons, I'm saying, yeah, there's also a soft problem. In other words, there's a problem that is malleable to human agency. We can do something about it. It's not completely hopeless, or at least that's what I'm going to argue, right? So it's this middle way between cynicism and utopianism, uh, which is a big theme of these, these episodes. So we do, for instance, have evidence that if you put people in a social space, 
and you know you design it in certain ways people become most so, more sociable we've discussed that uh, uh, at length during these episodes but i want to focus a little bit more on on the vanguard right the leadership the leaders um these people that are going to drive the re the, the, the revolution and this is a very pressurizing role in society and you know it can easily go pretty bad as as we've discussed and usually the idea is is you know you want people to be less selfish and you know there's issues around power da 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 anyway okay what i'm going to do is i'm going to make a proposition okay and the proposition is is that the reason you know activists vanguard people leadership people core organizers get stressed is because number one they believe in the material world they believe you know this is a piece of paper this is my shirt there's a real world out there and it is what it is and there's no messing about on it they also believe in the self they believe in me i'm roger hallam i do this bad things happen to me um I am this personality, I am a thing, you know, this is my stuff, I possess things in the world. You know, this is the default, in other words, the philosophical, spiritual default of our, of our culture, at least Western culture, and particularly Western in middle class culture. In other words, and this comes on to the central theme of this, of this episode, which is there's no transcendence. So I'm going to focus on this key word of transcendence, transcendence as the mechanism through which we solve at least the soft problem of transforming the revolutionary culture and at least giving a nod to that XR guy going, if there's not personal transformation, you're lost, mate. You know, everyone's just going to be shit to each other and nothing's going to happen. So let's investigate a little bit more about this tradition and the mechanics, as you might say, of of, tran of transcendence so so there's this idea that you know you should do good work you shouldn't get corrupted and this is an ethical issue it's like be good because good is good yeah and that's got a lot going for it but transcendence I would argue and I think other people would say the same transcendence is not primarily about ethics it's not about being good it's about metaphysics it's about the way you see yourself and the way you see the world and of course a lot of people when you use the word metaphysics they go, Ooh, you know but the fact of the matter is is everyone watching or listening to this podcast has a metaphysics right it's not like you can opt out you have an idea of what the world is you can have an idea about yourself and there's various sort of related questions and there's loads of cultural orientations around what what your metaphysics is you know whether you engage in transcendence or not for instance so transcendence you know is largely rooted in eastern culture but i'm going it's in the western culture as well but let's have a look at the broad idea so the broad idea is number one right which is the world's the function of the mind this is in Western philosophy, obviously, as well. It's called idealism. In other words, the world actually isn't real. All there is is your mind. There's me, and the world is a function of my mind. And this is a very old idea, you know, ancient wisdom, you know, ancient philosophy, blah, blah, blah. But it's also modern science, right? You know, modern science has undermined uh, this reductive materialism. This isn't actually a shirt. It's, it's my mind interpreting you know, various atoms or, you know, light waves coming into my brain and my brain forms it into a picture, forms it into a meaning system and goes, hi, there's, there's, there's the shirt. So, you know, maybe, maybe not. But the, the point here is because you don't think the world is real or at least if you're open to a pluralism of, of interpretation, you know, maybe the world is real, maybe it is not, as opposed to the world is real, you know, in this sort of tight dogmatism. If you think the world is real and you've got this tight do dogmatic attachment, then obviously you're going to be a tricky person in so much as you're really attached to possessions, you're really attached to power, you have this scarcity orientation, you have this zero-sum notion, you know, this is my shirt, 
you can't take it in all this sort of stuff. Well, if you've got the transcendence orientation, you know, it's a bit of a silly example, but you can take my shirt and I'm going to go, so what? You know, that was just an interpretation in my brain. You know, I'm, I'm still here in the moment, as you might say, which leads us on to this notion of the self. So there's the same criticism or the same idea of transcendence, which is the self, where is it? You know, we discussed this in a few of the episodes. Where exactly is the self? Like, oh, so here's myself. So what's the thing that's saying, here's myself? So is there something that's looking at the self? And if there is, then what's looking at the self? It all gets really confusing. And the point here is not that, hey, hey, you know, there's the, a last word on the matter. The point of transcendence is again to entertain, at least initially entertain the proposition that it's not a, at all immediately obvious who you are listening to this podcast. I mean, who exactly are you? It's not like a chair where you're just going, well, there's a chair. You can't see the self. In other words, the self really is a religious concept in the sense that it's an act of faith. It's, it's a proposition. It's a hypothesis. It's not that is the self. It's not something you can be dogmatic about. So this is really interesting, of course, because again, if you don't have the concept of a self through time and space, a thing that possesses other things, then you get less attached to power, you get less attached to material possessions. And this obviously feeds into what we're saying about people that have an active engagement in transcendence, uh, know what it is, and to a certain extent, uh, enter into rituals of transcendence, which we'll come on to in a minute, then they're going to be cooler people, basically. Um, so you're dealing a little bit, arguably, with the soft problem. And, you know, those of you that know all about this, you're probably going, well, Roger, it's not quite like that. I'm not here to give you a two-hour lecture on transcendence and all the different, you know, variations on the theme buddhism and all this sort of stuff right you can show and check that out what i'm trying to say is is there's a there's a valid critique of the 40 episodes i've done which is that really you need to start starting at vert commas with this this notion of transcendence because if you're not able to engage in transcendence the big problems all right so so to summarise a bit, this is, you know, it's it's arguably good and right in itself to be to not be selfish, to be a team player. But what we're also saying is 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 that it's actually good for society. It's not just an end in itself. As a sociologist, sociologist, you're saying actually it leads to good movements. It leads to effective movements, and religious people, as a general rule, are better. <laughs> Again, as a general rule, don't get me wrong, right? It's a normal distribution curve. There's lots of religious people and social movements who are a real problem. But there's something interesting going on, and that's what we're looking at. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so... So, let's look at this. Two examples of this, right? Another two examples. So... One way in which transcendence manifests itself is to say that you you engage in the act of love, defined as engaging in the well-being of others, um, as an end in itself. In other words, you love love for itself, or you love God because God is love, and you don't love God to get stuff, right? That's not the idea. It is because it is it is the thing to do. So you can see the massive social benefits of that because you're not wanting a return. So you're not saying, well, I was nice to you, so I need you to be nice back. Um, because love is just a function of your consciousness. It's, it's something that you do because, as I said, that's who you are. So in a social context, this is has massive advantages, right? And it manifests itself in your attitude towards violence. So violence, people engaging in violence, it's a, it's rooted in the idea of vengeance often. You know, you did something bad to me, I'm not able to forgive you, all this sort of thing. But it's also rooted in the idea 
that I want to get somewhere. I want to get somewhere and I'm going to engage in violence to get there because the end justifies the means. But if you have this like love transcendence orientation, it doesn't make any sense because you're violating. This is not an ethical thing, right? It's a metaphysical thing. There's, it's ridiculous to engage in violence because violence is a transgression of your fundamental orientation, which is to be true to your consciousness, to be true to the act of love. So it, it's, it's just not what you're going to do. Right? In other words, you're not here to change the world. You're here to be true to what it means to be conscious. And the paradox, of course, and we've discussed this, you know, in the episodes, the paradox of this orientation is it actually creates better social change, like orientate social change projects. So, yeah, you know, that sort of connects a bit with Western tradition. Western tradition is very centered around love. You know, God is love, all this sort of stuff. Um, the visible world in the Western tradition, you know, it's not real. What's real is is God and you're there to serve God, da, da, da. So, you know, hopefully you get the the idea. And and this is juxtaposed with this, this notion of justice. So arguably one of the big problems here is, is the revolutionary tradition of the last 200 years has been dogmatically secular. It's been materialist. And, you know, I kill to get equality. It's either us or them. It's a zero-sum game. There's a sort of reductionism in communism. You know, it's like there's equality and everything else is irrelevant. And in capitalism, you know, you're there to get a profit. It's materialist. They both feel like mirror images of themselves because they come from this similar reductive materialist, you know, hyper-rationalist tradition. And what gets left out of all that is the pluralism of, of life saying, I don't need to, you know, kill in order to get something which is fundamentally all there is because you have this hinterland of enchantment, as you might call it, right? You know, you like, you take pleasure in a nice day. You know, you take pleasure in a flower. You're bringing up your kids. There's all these things which make, give life meaning apart from this, you know, desire to create equality or desire to have profit. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing, of course, is all these reductive materialists are saying, yeah, yeah, you know, going after communism going after capitalism it's going to create this great society this utopian society and of course it doesn't right you know we've got more inequality in in the world today than we've ever had uh and it's not that great right and and what the transcendence tradition is saying is the reason is is because you're shooting yourself in the foot because if you have if you have a a culture, a revolutionary project, which is mad about equality, then it's sending the message that all that's important is having the same amount of stuff as everyone else, which sends the message that the only thing that's important in life is stuff. Well, if, there's, if, the, if the only important thing in life is stuff, then obviously everyone's going to try and get more of it. You know, there's a sort of self-contradictory element to it. While the transcendence tradition is saying, the route to equality is to demote the notion of materiality. In other words, to say, actually having more stuff, yeah, if you want more stuff, fine. But I don't because it's not that important. My relationships are more important or, you know, my relationship to God or, you know, doing the gardening. In other words, you get to a, an end of social equality by not doing reductive materialism, by having this hinterland, by going, it really doesn't matter. Now, I'm not saying, right, that therefore this revolutionary tradition of, you know, materialist justice, those people taking my land, you know, all this sort of stuff is wrong, right? What I'm saying is, is it's imbalanced. It needs to balance itself with the transcendence anti-materialist orientation. And maybe, you know, the right strategy is something in between the two. Who knows? Uh, because, you know, there's loads of super spiritual people out there that are just hopeless when it comes to the justice 
orientation. So this is, you know, like I said in the other add-ons, there's, there's something here about um, conscious incompetence, right? And it's like we're fumbling away with these orientations and maybe the best we can hope for is that they, that you're aware of it, right? The problem isn't materialism. The problem is that people with a materialist attitude have no conception of transcendence. That's the problem, arguably. Um, and the, you know, the last thing I'll say about the theory of it, as it were, is, and this is something that keeps me up at night, is if we carry on using materialist reductionism in a context of existential threat, nuclear war, you know, destroying the natural world, the climate crisis, all the rest of it. In other words, we're, if we've gained enough power as the human race uh, to basically destroy ourselves, we need a new operating system, as some people call it, to prevent us getting into absolute zero sum social conflict. You know, like my ideology is more important than yours, so I'm going to kill for it, so I'm going to extract everything to be in competition with you. You know, that might, you know, that led to lots of problems historically, but this moment in history, that's going to lead to human extinction. So in other words, you know, this is why I'm finishing with this episode, is is we have to get a grip with this. And the ex, the guy in the XR meeting is saying something really profound, which is we need a whole new way of looking at ourselves and the world, at least a far more pluralistic way, a more relaxed way, where we're not going to engage in violence and where we're not going to fall for the extractivist myth that that's what humans do, right? We extract, we oppress, we slaughter. Um, no, we don't, right? We don't need to do that. We can do something else, which is more interesting. Okay. All right, so let's, you know, where are we up to? Let's spend a little bit of time looking at the practice because, you know, what the sort of guy I am, I'm all into, okay, what does this mean? You know, what does this mean next Wednesday? All this sort of thing. So many of you know these things, right? But it's good to just acquaint ourselves with how the spirit, as you might say, enacts itself in time and space. How we design transcendence, this humanization. All right, so meditation. I'm not going to talk much about meditation because I don't meditate, so I feel like I'm a hypocrite. But, you know, the fact of the matter is engaging the, in the act of thinking about what you are and that you're not anything other than what you are in this moment obviously is productive in terms of creating that detachment. And I'm not the guy to sort of go into all the little nuts and bolts of the various means of transcendence. But it's a massively important part of the mix. So is role-playing. Role-playing is my thing. What does role-playing do? It's a little bit like transcendence, but it's changing the mind around, right? What role-playing does is your body and your mind become something else, and that enables you to to become more effective in regulating yourself. So, for instance, this doesn't happen very often, but I think it could or should in social movements is you actually role-play working in a group. So someone says something bad to you and you role-play forgiving them, or you role-play being told you're not in your job anymore and you role-play being gracious about it, or you role-play being bullied or someone being aggressive to you and you role-play being being calm in response. Um, and you fake it, right? In other words, the way to introduce the idea of transcendence isn't to be intellectualized. You know, I don't want to have a big argument about you, about whether the material world exists or doesn't exist. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing is we're trying to free up your sense of self so that you can be more flexible and adaptable when shit happens to you and and you can be, become more resilient and social movements can become more more effective. 
Okay, so in other words, you make it up or at least you go, well, maybe, maybe I'm just going to do it, right? I don't need to have a big argument with myself about whether this works or it doesn't work. So for instance, we've got other things which I think need to be introduced into the secular or the post-secular revolutionary space. In other words, things that move beyond this, oh, you're a religious Roger or are you secular, right? It's all bollocks. What we want to do is, is recognise um, that things can just have meaning. That's all we need to ask. Does this have meaning? So, for instance, you know, I like reading bits of the Bible. You know, not, not a lot, dare I say, because I don't have the time. But when I'm reading the Bible, I don't go, oh, my God, does that mean I'm a follower of Jesus? Does that mean I'm religious? I'm reading scripture because it provides an internal, aids an internal dialogue about meaning, about who I am and how I can be in greater service. That's it. I don't need to know, you know, whether the Bible's good or bad or whether Abraham was a patriarch or something, right? I'm just, you know, it's the same as reading a book, a novel. I'm just reading a novel because I like it, okay? I like gardening. I just like it. We don't need to have this big, you know, heaviness around it. The same with prayer, you know, there's a bit a big part of me is instinctively against prayer, you know. Oh, you're praying, you're praying to God, God doesn't exist, it's ridiculous, how irrational, how stupid. That's reductive materialism. When people pray, you know, maybe they are being sort of materialist in a religious sense. They think there's a God up there, but maybe they don't. And maybe you don't need to have to decide whether God exists or not to pray. When you're praying, you're basically moving around the different elements of the self, which by definition are constructed by yourself, right? There's no right way here. There's like an infinite complexity, as you might say. Um, so you don't need to know why it's a good idea. But all these things like statements of belief, prayer, reading scripture, they're all mechanisms which for thousands of years enable people to enter into a constructive collectivity. And we need to reinvent them for the 21st century. And then this moves on to this notion of of the management of suffering. And we already do this in social movements. We do non-violence training. You, know, you get dragged along the floor, someone shouts at you, and you just you know, practice being non-violent. And, you know, there's a transactional reason for doing this, which is, hey, you know, when you go out on the road, you want to be staying cool. But there's something a lot deeper going on, which is you're enabling yourself to detach itself from the crap that happens to it. And that's good for, for your life. Similarly, like when you've been to prison, like I think this should be like compulsory. How did your spirit fare in prison, right? Which is sort of funny in a way, but it allows people to transcend. You know, these things happen to me. This is shit, prison, so awful. You know, human beings are terrible. There's a lot of temptation towards burnout, disappointment, you know, isolation, da, da, da. Let's come together and transcend that through group discussion. In other words, the experience of suffering is an opportunity for transcendence as much as a danger of burnout, right? And this is the more generic point here that engaging in the world, engaging in, in transcendent action provokes in us all because we're all human, like anger, rage, the desire for retribution, you know, admit it to yourself, you know, <laughs> let's get rid of them. <laughs> um, this is human, right? And it can be transcended through culture, cultural practice, through ritual. So where are these things in, in the movement? You know, it needs designing, but it needs to be designing in a way that doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We're not all going to go to monasteries and pray for the rest of our lives really i'm not saying anything original here you know as with most things gandhi said it you know going through through purification right self-purification as it was called very gandhi phrase <laughs> um you know in order to go and do non-violence in other words they're two sides of the same coin as gandhi would say there's non-violence there's the actual act of transgression and then there's the inner work which is saying okay who am i Am I able to go into confrontation and stay 
a loving person um, in its work, it needs working on, obviously. So I think my big point here, again, relating to the soft part of the hard problem, is that the big danger is you can't do transcendence separate from transgression. In other words, if you just do transcendence like it's understood in Western, you know, New Age culture, it doesn't actually, it's not transcendence. It's just uh, an entertainment of the self, I would say. Um, you know, maybe it's got some benefits for your personal life, but in a holistic sense, the personal life is the social life and vice versa, right? What we need to do is to embed transcendence in the act of transgression, as Gandhi said in his own words. And I just want to finish with a classic example of this is I had a friend who was a Buddhist. He was one of my best mates at school. And, you know, he read all the texts and he's done the meditation and he's done his PhD on Buddhism and what have you. And he's, he's a really great guy, right? But he's learned everything in a, in, a, in a context of consensus, in a context of privilege, in a context of everything's fine, nothing's really bad happened to him. And then, I don't know the details of it, so, but it's something along the lines of he was working in a school and some pathological person came along, you know, and basically pushed him out of his job and took his job. And he was shocked by the feelings of hate he had and, you know, savage ret retribution, you know, fucking hate this person. And he, these, these feelings were involuntary. So despite all his years of meditation, despite always, always, you know, reading the books, didn't actually come to anything. And of course, the reason is pretty obvious, isn't it? It's because he hadn't engaged in transcendence through the actuality of interpersonal and social conflict. There's no substitute for doing it in situ. And that really is, is the best I can do. And I suggest all of us can do when we're designing how to deal with the fourth hard problem, which is, you know, people being bad and, and what have you. Um, so to summarise, what we're trying to do is, is service, respect and trust. Maybe there's other words for it, but that's what I'm sticking at at the end of this series. Those are the things, those are the key values to create this social movement that's going to transform our societies in the next, you know, few decades. And, and those values are created through transcendence in the space, in the site, as it were, of transgression action on the street, in prison, you know, in the, the meeting with people. And maybe just maybe that will create this miracle, this transcendence from materialism, you know, this cynicism that we're all done for, this doom sort of cop-out, in my view. Um, no, miracles happen and they can happen again. And it's something to do with what I've talked about in this final episode. Who knows, right? Who am I to say? Anyway, thanks so much. That's it. This is the final episode. Good luck, everyone. And um, yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking to you all. Thank you.